Case number 102605, State of Kansas v. Thurber. I'll ask counsel to rise and state their appearances for the record. Your Honor, Justin Thurber appears by and through counsel, Mr. Nelson and Jeffrey Wilson. And please support Chris Elsweger, Deputy Solicitor General. Thank you. People always ask if we're going to take a break on a case of this magnitude and its length. And our answer is a definitive, it depends. And it depends on how long the first argument will take. Even though you may reserve time for rebuttal, my colleagues have been known to ask a question or two. And that might extend the time otherwise expected. And we're just going to have to see how things go. If things go very smoothly, we'll just proceed with everything. All right. Counsel, you may proceed. Please, the court, Reed Nelson representing Justin Thurber. I would like to request 15 minutes, 15 minutes for rebuttal. 15 minutes is granted. Yes, thank you. And this is a, Justin Thurber was convicted of capital murder and he was sentenced to death. And this is a direct appeal from that conviction and from the death sentence. I'm going to start and I hope to cover three issues during my time and any questions you have about anything else. And what I would like to start with is the intellectual disability issue. I raised, there's sort of two related issues to this. One is that it should have been, it ought to be remanded for whatever you want to call it, an Atkins hearing or a Hall hearing under the correct law. And the second is that our Kansas statute on this question is flatly unconstitutional. So let me start, if I may, with the first one about a remand for reconsideration of this very important issue. The trial court found that there was insufficient evidence to warrant an evidentiary hearing to determine whether he was intellectually disabled. Just to frame this, Mr. Nelson, the timing of your request for this hearing was a day prior to sentencing. Is that right? I think a day before sentencing, the court was hit with this motion. Is that right? A day prior to the court sentencing, you mean? Yes. When was the motion first put before the court? And I guess my question is, why wasn't it done prior to trial? Oh. Or what, the timing of this is concerning. Your Honor, I think the statute is not very clear on when this is supposed to be done. I mean, I understand that it would make some sense to have it done before trial and save, you know, save a penalty phase if he's found intellectually disabled. I think that makes some sense. But I think the statute is very unclear. But it certainly allows for counsel to make the request, file the motion. And, you know, the court considered that. The prosecution was wondering when this ought to be done. And the court considered that and entertained the motion, heard the proffered evidence, and made a ruling. And that's why we're here. Mr. Nelson, this issue has caused me some angst as well, just trying to get my arms around it. Because the motion was filed right the day before the sentencing hearing. In both your side's briefs, you only give it two pages. So it's not that, I mean, 27 issues and hundreds of pages of briefs, the issue didn't get that much attention. Then what happened is the law changed. You had Hall and the statutes changed and the statute was made retroactive. Then you come in with a supplemental brief, and I think it's issue 23, where you alert us to all of that. And then you kind of make the argument that the statute's unconstitutional and so he can't get the correct hearing, so we need to convert this to life imprisonment rather than death. And I understand all that. But here's my question. I think we can agree 
that the defendant is entitled to at any stage before execution to make sure that he's not mentally retarded as that's defined so what are the mechanics let's assume we're not going to vacate the death sentence because of some statutory issues but we need a remand because of the changes of the law just give me those let me give you those uh, what do we do do we stop right now and decide that issue send it down or do we decide let's just say guilt and sentencing and assuming that it's affirmed you still should get your hearing but how do we what what do you want in terms of the mechanics of this you see what I'm saying yes your honor I do because because we did have set forth a lot of issues and almost everything that we had put forward goes to the guilt goes to the penalty almost everything uh, goes to the penalty phase and if this issue we've well, got deter- 10 issues on guilt and yes, 17 and, and, on sentencing and, and even like the that. ones on guilt really go to the penalty phase I mean they do we're alleging prejudice and, and we want right. to you know so yeah absolutely if a, a determination on intellectual disability if it went in mr. Thurber's uh, favor would would dispose of obviously a lot of this case and so I have no objection in fact I would um, uh, recommend or put forward that absolutely we um, or would request that the case uh, be remanded for this hearing and we do not have an issue or any problem um, with the court putting the rest of the issues um, you know on, on uh, until this hearing was done or that determination was made. Am I clear? Holding everything else in essence? That's right. Your Honor. Retaining appellate jurisdiction? Yes, yes. Kind of like a Van Cleave. A Van Cleave, that's right. Uh, and I think that would be very appropriate. And, and as I talked a little bit about this intellectual disability issue, intellectual disability issue, um, I mean, there's enough, there's enough to it in my opinion, there's enough to it that, that this is a real possibility, and I will talk about that. That's my position. Yeah. The next question I have is, okay, let's say we have to remit. What's our point of time reference? Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, not like if, it's not like you can say the trial court erred the day before sentencing. And so we ought to go back and look at what the evidence was the day before sentencing, seems like. Seems like you would want, and the law would seem to say, that we need to know what the intellectual disability issue is today. Because I'm not sure it changes over time, but your right to not be executed Um, if there's an intellectual disability, is sort of going to go all the way up to the day of execution, right? So so if we remand it, what point in time do we look at? And does it really do any good to do it now as opposed to get these other issues resolved? And then if we do end up close to execution, you have have your hearing then in a more uh, contemporaneous uh, setting. See, I'm getting I, yes, I understand. I, I think I understand. And, and well, for example, if we went back and looked just at the evidence that it, as it existed in front of the trial court at the time, you have to wrestle with, with your own expert who said he's not mentally retarded. So it seems like the question you're asking got answered by your own evidence. And, 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 mm. uh, well, uh, so we wrestle with that as opposed to wrestling with just what the law is in terms of what ought to be evaluated today, uh, you know, and, and and see what the facts are as of today. See what I'm getting at? Well, kind of, kind of. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I kind of am. I, I think, I mean, if it, if it went back, for example, you know, of Ann Cleave or temporary, uh, if, if this went back for a hearing, um, you know, I think everything would be in play. In other words... Well, Counselor, the reason that it's important whether we have an intellectual disability and the reason it would be 
uh, unlawful is is under the Eighth Amendment, isn't it? Yes. It's categorically unconstitutional to sentence a person to death if they have intellectual disability, it isn't is, it? It, it, it is. Wouldn't it be unconstitutional at the time it was it was pronounced? And so what happens after that, I don't understand how that's going to change anything because that, to me, that's an illegal sentence if, uh, at the time it was pronounced. Where am I thinking wrong? Uh, is that what the U.S. Supreme Court said? I, I'm not quite following. I'm, I'm not I quite think following. He's, he's differentiating between pronouncement, time of pronouncement versus time of execution. In my right. Opinion. You mean pronouncement right. of sentence? Yes. Right, that at the time of pronouncement, it was categorically unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment because the person was intellectually disabled. Right. Yes. Um, well, and that's the question: is 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 it uh, only unconstitutional when it's executed, or is it unconstitutional when it's pronounced? And I think the difference is is my colleague's uh, uh, discussion of when do you make the determination of intellectual disability, huh. and and it's the timing would be whenever it's. Really? A, Effective. It, it should well yeah, in a I mean, perfect world. It should have been made by the trial court under the correct law. In a perfect world, it would have been made by the trial judge at that time under the correct law. But the question is, when was was an, an error? Was it should have been made? It wasn't. But that is that unconstitutional at that point, or is it only unconstitutional as as my colleague is is asking when the the execution is, is scheduled. Well, I think we, you know, we look at it when the motion, when the motion was made. And don't we look at the law as it existed at the time the motion was made? Then, and the evidence, well, and, and the evidence that had been presented as of that moment. Well, we didn't. That starts to beg the question. We didn't get to present evidence. Well, the, you filed a motion, and you presented. I mean, so there, I mean, but again. Are we looking at that moment in time when you filed your motion and the district court ruled and we would look at what the evidence was in trial and whether the, whether the district court erred based on the laws that existed at that moment? Because you've got a whole bunch of briefing about law that happened after oh, I understand. that. And so I understand. why would we look at that law if I think I understand to, if we're supposed question. to grab this moment in time? Because because this law is a moving target, and you, uh, Justice Biles, you mentioned, you know, that our initial brief only devoted two pages to this, and you're right, because the law began to change at that time. All we had was Adkins at that time, and we had the Kansas Constitution, which was flawed, or the Kansas statute. But which that's was all flawed. the district court had at that time. That's, that's right. That's right. But Adkins, it turns out, has been interpreted by Hall, which came later and prompted us to do more briefing. So Adkins, interpreted by Hall, shows that the Kansas statute is flatly unconstitutional and the judge was looking at incorrect law. And so were the parties. So were the parties. When they were looking at the Kansas Constitution to decide whether our client should get an evidentiary hearing, that law was wrong under Hall as made clear, um, under Adkins as later made clear by Hall. Akin to what happened when Aline rendered our hard 50 unconstitutional. That's right. It, so it's a, it's a progressive thing, but it is retroactive. It is absolutely retroactive. Hall is strong law now, and there are lots of Florida cases that are being reversed and remanded for Adkins hearings right now under exactly the same conditions as we have. Somebody with similar IQ, but they didn't have the correct law. The judge didn't in those Florida cases. I have like five or six of them that I gave you in a notice of later case law, just this year, where the, def the uh, defendant has this IQ that's over 70, and nobody knew at the time, or nobody was thinking at the time, that that, that, that meant he could be intellectually disabled. But Hall absolutely comes along and clarifies that, that that's what the law has always been. 
And so those cases are being remanded. Remanded temporarily or potentially temporarily? How, how, what's the, the original question was, what's the mechanism? I'm sorry, and I, I, I don't know what the mechanism, mechanism should be. It's just that I know when well, the I issue... I just wonder if you can tell from the Florida cases themselves I, I, what they're doing. I can't tell you. Only I can tell you that when those cases hit that Florida Supreme Court, in whatever posture they're in, I believe, I don't know for a fact that they're in exactly this posture, but, you know, when they hit the Florida Supreme Court, they look and see, did they have an, a 70 IQ cutoff? If they had a 70 IQ cutoff, it violates Hall. It goes back down for a hearing for that person. If they're in the 70s and 80s of IQ, it puts them in range of Hall with adaptive functioning. So all they look, was there a 70 IQ cutoff that the trial court applied at any time after Atkins? And if there was, it gets remanded for an evidentiary hearing. What do we do with your expert who said that uh, Mr. Thurber was not mentally retarded? Well, okay, number one, I don't necessarily agree with that characterization. He says I'm not saying he is, okay. But number two, that expert was in the same boat as everybody else, as the trial judge, as the parties. The only thing that that expert knew was that Mr. Thurber had an estimated IQ of 10 points over 70 under the Kansas statute at that time, which was wrong, that made him not mentally retarded. So the expert was looking at the same thing that defense counsel were, and defense counsel said the same thing, Justice Miles. Defense counsel said to the jury, he's 10 points over being mentally retarded. The reason why defense counsel said that is because defense counsel didn't know that the Kansas statute is wrong. Kansas statute said 70 and below is mentally retarded, and that's it. So, well, well, the trial court went farther than that, though. It, it referred to the your client's own um, expert in saying he. I'm not saying he's mentally retarded, but also looked at his functioning in court and his functioning that was of uh, that was uh, part of the evidence in the case that he graduated from high school, went to college, um, and past courses in college, wouldn't that be indication that he wasn't suffering from the adaptive deficits that's in question here? Not at all, Your Honor. Why in, not? In fact, this just shows that the trial court was not the trial court's fault at all. That the trial court didn't know what Hall requires. Hall requires adaptive deficits. Well, Hall didn't exist then. I mean, right. We have to get keep getting back to this poor trial judge, you're quoting law that comes into being after this motion is decided. I think that becomes hard for people to understand, you know, at what point in time we're going to grab the legal standard that we need to decide whether the trial court erred. Correct. And, 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 and what, what is wrong with looking at those factors and, and, and looking at that and saying, no, there's not, that, that doesn't rise to a level of requiring a hearing. Because there, because Hall requires two things, and we have to apply Hall. Hall is good law for this court right now. Okay, Hall requires two things: an IQ that is somewhere around 70. It can be above 70 now. It can be 70s to 80s, which is exactly what Mr. Thurber, his estimated IQ, was 70s to 80s. But in addition, you have to look at adaptive deficits. Deficits. And that is the key. The judge, in this case, looked at only strengths. And exactly what you said, Justice Rosen, the trial court erred because it just reeled off these adaptive strengths. Oh, he went to uh, two years of junior college. Never mind, it took him, what, six years to complete that. Oh, you know, he, uh, you know, he did this in high school. You know, never. So he watched the, he watched the videotape of the uh, police interviews. He referenced that and said, you know, I've watched how Mr. Thurber reacts to questioning and, and that through, sort of thing. Through, but, but through the lens of not having any idea that you're to look at adaptive deficits. And, you know, people have strengths. People who are intellectually disabled have strengths. And, you know, they can actually converse and carry on conversations. 
Paul only requires mild, mild intellectual disability, not severe. So, didn't your expert look at adaptive strengths? Yes, and they were low. So, for example, our expert said that he had a global functioning of moderate to severe difficulties in social and occupational functions. That sounds very much like adaptive deficits to me. Um, there was testimony that he was socially awkward throughout school. He had no friends. His dog was his best friend growing up. Uh, these are marks of people who are not good socially. He, you know, the judge looked at his fast food restaurants. He did not fit in at these fast food restaurant jobs. He, um, he had a sixth grade reading level after two years of junior college. Um, he was Logan when detective when the, that psychologist or psychiatrist Logan examined him for the uh, for competency. You know what Logan said? Logan said he is not understanding and not remembering what has happened at hearings. Ron Evans, the trial attorney, looked at him during the penalty phase and told the jury, you can tell just by looking at him that there's something wrong with him. Um, so he, his parents testified. He had a hard time doing normal things on his own. He had a hard time living on his own. He couldn't handle money very well. Uh, they were concerned because he wouldn't be able to take his medications on his own when he was out of the house. So these are adaptive deficits, and quite frankly, they have got to be informed by clinical experience. These are, the trial judge should not have been in a position of having to be a clinician, having to be a psychologist in determining this motion. The, the trial court should have ordered an evidentiary hearing, appointed two psychologists, like the statute says, and not had to be an expert himself, because he obviously wasn't. He wasn't looking at adapt adaptive functioning. Is, is there going to be an instance in which this type of hearing isn't going to be required in, in every death penalty litigation? It just, mm -hmm. seems, is, can, it just seems to me this is what you're really asking for and what you say the law is now, is that this is going to have to be a determination in every case. Uh, this, you mean intellectual disability yes. determination? Yeah. If somebody I mean, has the some... things you're describing as far, as far as deficits, adaptive deficits, they seem to me to appear in every case. So then we need to know what the IQ is, right? The IQ has got to be in the 70s and 80s, probably. Although there is no cutoff. Right, there is no cutoff. That, it just, it just seems to me you can make an argument that this is going to be well, a part of. Of, of death penalty litigation. It could be a part of a lot of death penalty litigation because the U.S. Supreme Court has said absolutely mild mental, not severe. Right. Mild mental retardation is an absolute bar to execution. Categorically uh, cruel and unusual. It is. And Justice Kennedy has said that clearly. And that's where we're at. And so, gosh, here is Justin with, quite frankly, a whole raft of adaptive deficits, deficits. And Justice Ginsburg just wrote an opinion this year in Morby, Texas, and I cited that to you in recent cases, where she doubles down on this idea of adaptive deficits. You don't, and this goes to your question, I think, Justice Rosen, again, what the trial court did wrong in, in, in analyzing this, looking at the strengths in Morby, Texas. That case got reversed by Justice Ginsburg because in Texas, they were looking at these Brezeno factors, which are strengths, and she reversed it. And she said, you do not look at the strengths, we look at adaptive deficits. So that's where we are. That's the law. It's, I think it's binding on this court, it's binding on us. Um, it needs to be followed. Uh, he's asked for that evidentiary hearing. Uh, I think Council, that, if we were in a different situation, uh, the direct appeal was completed and your client or your hypothetical client manifested some intellectual disability. Is there a process or what would be the procedure for getting a determination prior to execution, prior to the sentence being carried out? Because presumably, as I think Justice Biles kind of started the questioning, this might be a moving target. Yeah. 
Do, do you understand my question? I think so. About when, so what's the process? About when it should be asked for. Or I understand that you're in the process. I mean, this was requested at the, at the trial court, and we're still in the direct appeal. But just sort of hypothetically, it, wouldn't there be a collateral process that would come afterwards? Quite frankly. Or is this your one shot? That's what I'm asking. Is that, well, is that your position? It, to me, it's going to be law of the case. In other words, I don't know. You well, how can it be law of the case if, if in fact, a, a person's, um, I'll just use the phrase intellectual disability, may be a, a moving target? In other words, uh, that can change, can't it? Um, sometimes it has to be sh shown before you're 18 years old, if that's your... You mean if you're intellectual, if you can become well, I guess that's more my intelligent question. or less intelligent? Yeah, or, or I um, think perhaps that somebody suffers a, a, a traumatic brain okay. injury or something of that I, nature. I, I, I am not an expert. And this is part of the problem in this case. We have got to have these decisions informed by experts, which we have none in this I mean, really none in this case, but my impression from what I've read is that it's not supposed to be considered a moving target. From what I have read, it's supposed to be a fixed number that started before you were 18, in most states, as a general thing. It's, it's, a, it's a mental condition. So your, your position really is this is a one-shot deal. If, if we lose here, if we're stuck with the district court's ruling, then Mr. Thurber has no remedy. That's my understanding, and, and I'll tell you, this is part of the problem with our statute. This is a terrible statute. I mean, it gives so little direction, and it's quite confusing. And Before we go there, just to clarify, so you would distinguish this situation from the mental illness situation, which we have seen around the country uh, right up to the you know, eve of execution, the motions are still being filed about um, changes of mental status. But in your view, that's not an option that would be available to Mr. Thurber or similarly situated defendants. Correct, Your Honor. I, 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 I haven't noticed that. I haven't been, I haven't, you know, I, I haven't even thought about that. I have just assumed from reading all these Florida remands for this determination to be made, my assumption has been that this is a one-shot thing, and it's got, and they have to do it right. Do, do we have any? And, and to be a broken record, we're talking about categorical uh, uh, unconstitutionality under the Eighth Amendment. Do we have any other categories in which a person can move in and out of the category? You know, we have the the youth, we have the non. Uh, murder uh, convictions and, and various other categories. It seems to me counterintuitive to say that you have a category that's uh, not amenable to the death uh, penalty, but that a person can move in and out of I that ca category. And that's what I'm hearing is, yeah, you later could be in the category even though you weren't when you were tried. And, and that makes no sense to me. You're either in the category or you're not. It's either mutable or not mutable. Right. And that's well, the question I think people are trying to ask you, and you're not a psychologist or psychiatrist, and you don't know the answer to it. And but I think that's got to be a, have a rule. But isn't it also complicated by the fact that this is, in most criminal cases, we don't look at these questions at the time of execution of the sentence. They're sent, they're sent to prison, and there's no... But um, in the death penalty case, we do re-examine at the time of execution in terms of Eighth, eighth Amendment, at least in the mental state. Um, so that, that does cause this categorical analysis to be a, a snapshot at different points in time, at the time of the crime, at the time of probably of pronouncement, but certainly then again at the time of execution, isn't it? I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. I mean, I, I just, I, I just haven't been seeing that. All I've been seeing is the, the, you know, the question gets raised, it gets determined, was it done correctly? You know, if it wasn't, we better get it done. And so, for example, you know, if this, if this had been done, I'm afraid that 
that it would have been law, law of the case. Or if it is done, for example, if this court does not grant my motion, you know, this remand, then I'm concerned that, that this is where we're at. I, you know, kind of a law of the case thing. The determination has been there wasn't enough evidence. I, I cut you off as you were starting to talk about the constitutionality of the statute. Yeah. And I would like to have you help me understand uh, or, or work through your argument with the application of 214629. I'm sorry. If, if we find the statute to be unconstitutional, your argument that 214629 requires us to convert this to a life sentence. And, just a plain meaning of that statute, a sentence of death or any provision of this act authorizing such sentences held to be unconstitutional. How does this statute um, apply to a sentence of death or any, or, or any provision of an act authorizing such sentence? Um, be, um, how am I getting to? How are, you getting, how are you getting to an application of that statute under these facts. Can you help me walk through that? Oh, um, this provision about the, about the intellect and that being a bar to execution, that this provision, which I maintain is unconstitutional, was part of the original provisions for the death penalty, for capital punishment. It's in among those statutes. It was part of that original 1994 session law, and the statute that you just cited says that if any provision of that capital procedure, which this is one, is found to be unconstitutional, any provision, then the person has to be sentenced as otherwise required by law. So that's how I... So just having it be in the act is... That's right. In the act, it's in that session. Well, this very, this exact paragraph talking about intellectual disability being a bar, that exact paragraph is in that 1994 session law and has been carried through till now, which I believe is flatly unconstitutional for about three reasons. Doesn't talk anything about adaptive functioning. It throws in an insanity test, narrowing it to something that Justice Scalia in a dissent in Adkins said, he, he picked out Kansas and put in his dissent, Kansas stands out from all the other states as being a state that requires severe mental retardation, not mild mental retardation, severe mental retardation along the lines of the, what they had in the 1700s when they only barred execution of quote, idiots. So that's where Kansas is with this statute, 1700s we recognize that we will not execute, quote, idiots. We do not recognize mild mental retardation in that statute. I think it's flatly unconstitutional as it's written. And yes. add that, that to this complicated procedural mechanism or discussion that we have been having. If, if you assume um, that we do find it unconstitutional then as I understand your argument is we don't even uh, remand, we just immediately convert this to a life sentence? Yes, Your Honor, it's converted to a life sentence and that's the end of that. That's what the statute says. And what if we disagree with that reading of the statute and feel that there still needs to be a remand? What happens then? Do we wait for the legislature to pass a statute that we deem I to be constitutional? Yes, Your Honor, you cannot happen? rewrite that legislation. Um, it is different than any other state. The legislature, for whatever reason, has written it this way with this specific provision. And keep in mind that there is no provision in this statute for adaptive functioning. None. That is central to Hall, to Adkins, to more v. Texas. It's, those are all about adaptive functioning. There is not one word in this statute about adaptive functioning. There's nothing to balance an IQ against in Kansas. Uh, you can determine IQ in other ways, right? That's what the amended statute allows a judge to do, determine an IQ in other ways, however you do that. That is not adaptive deficits. 
that Hall talks about. That the, I don't know if I'm being clear, it gets complicated very quickly, but what I'm, what I'm proposing to you is that there are huge chunks of this statute that do not comply in any way with Hall or Atkins. Uh, so yes, I do not think this court can rewrite that. I don't think that you can take out your magic marker and strike portions of that or add portions of that. Our legislature appeared to have specifically done it and carried it forward into the amended statute. Um, so yes, if you don't follow the provision that I'm talking about, then yes, I think that you have to, it's up for the legislature to, to monkey with this and get it, frankly, to comport with Hall. And this case just is in limbo until that happens? So the remand happens, and then what, I mean, what's the, what guides the district court on remand? That's why, <laughs> that's yeah. why I don't think this court can rewrite that statute. And so I think it, it, it has, the, what properly should happen is that this court should find that that provision is unconstitutional. This goes to, as otherwise provided by law sentence, and the legislature can do what the legislature will do with this crazy statute. Do we have to know that the statute applies to this defendant, though, before that provision kicks in? Which is, I mean, I think maybe there's two levels of standing here. One is even a threshold standing that he's within this population that might be affected so he can argue the unconstitutionality but a difference layer where we talk about whether or not it's unconstitutional as applied to his sentence. Because if, if a constitutional statute were applied to him and it was determined he was not intellectually disabled, um, would that be an unconstitutional sentence? And, and don't we have to look at the sentence being unconstitutional, the death penalty being unconstitutional under the language of that statute? not just that the statute's unconstitutional. You're wondering if the, if the a constitutional statute or would apply to him, is that what you're? No, or? I'm just wondering if before we convert to a life sentence, we have to know if a constitutional statute would apply to him. Right, yeah. well. Yeah, his, I his, think maybe we're yeah. saying the same it, thing. But in other words, if he had 140 IQ, <laughs> Would would the unconstitutionality of, of that provision uh, make any difference? Because he really doesn't have standing to challenge a provision that's not applicable to him. I think that's the question. Yeah. Well, more more what I'm thinking about is he he has an IQ of between seventy and eighty, but when you would do the evidence at a hearing, all of the experts would agree that he doesn't have adaptive deficiencies. So this is a person for whom the death penalty sentence would be constitutional. And we don't know that yet. So even though there's a, so even, another statute that's unconstitutional as to someone else, what does that mean? Well, he, you know, we have to, to me, we have to have a constitutional statute. We have to have correct law in front of the judge no, first. No matter right? whether he would have the, uh, the disability statute apply to him? I mean, if he's, if he's not going to qualify anyway? It does apply. In other words, uh, sort of, uh, it, it, I would, you know, first argue, it does apply to him because he, you know, it's, he has standing. He, he filed the motion after he was sentenced to death. Um, you know, and, and it, it was in front of the trial court, legitimately. He's got an IQ that I think that, that everybody agreed was... 70s to 80s, you know, this is, he's got, if you look through the record, there are adaptive deficits, fingerprints all through this record. The, you know, defense counsel said, look to the testimony of his parents in support of this. They're looking, they're pointing to adaptive deficits in the record. To me, that yeah. all means that uh, if we accept all of that, that he would be entitled to a new hearing. But what I'm struggling with is how do we, you know, does, do we convert this to a life sentence before that hearing? Or do we convert this, do we remand for a hearing once there is a constitutional statute 
in place. This, this provision is in play now. We are talking about it. We are, we are debating it. It is in play. Um, he filed his motion. They had, they had a hearing which was not good enough, but, but it was teed up. It was teed up. And here we are. Um, the statute, it's, 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 it's ripe. You know, it's not a hypothetical. The statute has got to be constitutional. You have got to have a constitutional statute in front of you, and so does the trial court in order um, to proceed here, and there isn't one. And so to me, it, 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 it's not a hypothetical situation. He, he, he is standing to raise this, right? He filed his motion. It was denied wrongly in terms of a hearing. Here we are. Um, we need a constitutional statute, and we don't have one. I think that's where we're at, and the legislature has got to fix it. So that kicks in the provision. If any provision of that death penalty is unconstitutional, this is, it's in front of you, he's got to be sentenced as otherwise required by law. Actually, any provision of this act authorizing such sentence, and that's what I understand the argument to be on the other side. Yeah, this is part of the act, but it doesn't authorize the sentence. No, I think it does authorize the sentence because if he's in a protected class, he cannot be executed. This authorizes a death sentence. I mean, I frankly think at some point there ought to be a question as to whether it's got to be determined by a jury or not, but, but that just shows you this is a requirement. When somebody files the motion to have this heard, this is a requirement. A fine, you know, this, this finding is required now for him to be executed, in my view. Counsel, you, uh, when you when you got up to the podium, you said you had three things you wanted to talk to us about, and, <laughs> um, and I think this is number one, right? <laughs> so at least let us know what the what what else you had on your list before we go to our list. Yes, um, I was going to talk about the Edwards, uh, the, the 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 Edwards. Uh, uh, where he invoked his right to an attorney five times. Okay. Let me ask you about that then. That, that goes to the Atterbury uh, video taped statement or the recorded statement. Uh, and as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, you do not claim that impacts our guilt phase analysis, correct? Correct. Okay. So explain to me how it impacts the sentencing phase? It impacts it greatly because the prosecutor blew the heinous and atrocious and cruel aggravator and just blew it so wide that it no longer applied to the actual act, to this actual murder. And this is one of the ways that they did it because they said, look at the interview that he gave to Agent Atterbury. Look at that. The body has not even been found. And he will, he is utterly indifferent. Okay? That's a part of heinous, atrocious, and cruel, being utterly indifferent. So the prosecutor That's because was, he's, um, if you look at the, let me paraphrase. So if you look at the videotape, the defendant in answering questions is calm. And so because he's calm, he's utterly indifferent. That's your argument, right? More than calm, he will not tell them, he will not confess and help them find this body. So it's substantive in terms of what responses he, I'm trying to yes. figure out how to quantify a video if the argument is, look how calm he is. Because, right. I mean, I, I've watched the videotape, but it, it's hard for me to, on appeal, how do I say he's too calm? Well, here's, but here's your, your argument is substantive that we look at the statements that were given and the fact that he didn't volunteer any knowledge he may have had about where the uh, victim was. Well, both, because the prosecution told the jury, look at that tape, okay? So the jury's gonna look at that tape and see how calm and cool and what a manipulator he is, 
Okay. And the prosecution said, and the body has not even been found. So let me get this straight. Because the defendant will not confess, that is going to be part of the prosecution's aggravating circumstance. It has nothing to do with heinous, atrocious, and cruel. And that was just one. So that's how the prejudice is. And that was repeated twice. And I think it was before and after the penalty phase. In that's other words, the heinous, atrocious, and cruel is supposed to go only to the act. To the act. The behavior in committing the crime as opposed to the attitude displayed by the defendant after the commission. Correct. It has to go to the act. And that was and that was not even the worst time the prosecutor did that. And that's why, you know, I'll quickly move to the prosecutorial misconduct part but of it. Is that your issue three that you wanted to address? Right. That's issue three, yes. The prosecutorial misconduct, in a related theme, the prosecution did exactly the same idea. He blew out the parameters of heinous, atrocious, and cruel when he said, look how he look how Thurber brought his parents into this. Okay? That was utterly indifferent to others. That was heinous, atrocious, and cruel, bringing his poor parents into this case. Now look, the jury has just heard about the worst thing the defendant has ever done in his life. All right? Horrible. Horrible. The defense mitigation now is all about the rest of his life. It is about weighing the rest of his life, his foibles, his strengths, his weaknesses, his failures, his home life, against that aggravator. And there's nobody better to do that for a defendant than the family. And so what happens? The family gets up there to testify as to the mitigating circumstances, and there were. Ron Evans argued to this jury, there is no better reason to spare this man but that his parents love him, the love of his family. We can all understand that. So what's the prosecutor do? He turns that into an aggravating circumstance. He says, utter indifference, it's heinous, atrocious, and cruel that he would bring his parents, his poor parents, into this. So, you know, heinous, atrocious, and cruel, which is supposed to be the act and the reason why the prosecution, I believe, kept doing this, in my view, stepping over the line throughout this entire trial, is because the most powerful part of its aggravator, the conscious physical suffering of this young lady, was speculative. It was totally speculative. And I'm not saying that it's not possible that she consciously, physically suffered. But the prosecution had a case where you don't know because she was hit on the head so hard it severed an artery. And their pathologist, none of their medical people, their pathologist did not testify that she was conscious and suffered consciously and wasn't challenged by the defense ever, but never testified to that. And that expert's silence on that point, in my view, is deafening. It is speculative. Their most weighty aggravator is speculative, and they pretended throughout their arguments, and particularly in opening, that it wasn't speculative, that it was fact that she had suffered. And they pretended to be, be heard through her eyes. So in any event, I got off on a little bit of a tangent on some of the other problems, but they, in my view, they blew out the parameters of heinous, atrocious, and cruel because they didn't they just had speculative evidence. And well, why isn't it? Isn't that speculative? Even, even if it is speculative, I'm, I'm not sure that it is, but if, if it is, uh, but it, it's pretty compelling evidence of atrocious, heinous, and cruel. And then you're bringing into some other factors that maybe go beyond that. Why doesn't the, the powerful evidence of the especially heinous and cruel involved in the act of this crime, consume that or overwhelm what was improper or what you arguably are saying is improper? Well, it doesn't over, yes, it doesn't overwhelm it for exactly that reason, because there is no evidence of conscious physical suffering in this case. 
I'm not saying that there isn't some evidence of heinous, atrocious, and cruel. No, no, just, well, yeah. okay, yeah. But, but that's out there. And then there's this other evidence brought in about his parents and that. Right, right. Why doesn't that play into the equation of saying, yeah, that could be there, and if, even if it's... Even if it's there, it's not overcome by the other evidence of the of what happened here. This court has to say beyond a reasonable doubt that any of these errors didn't affect the verdict. And I don't think that it can do that for these errors because this had to be a very closely balanced case. Clearly, the prosecutor was worried about it, misstating their evidence in their arguments, acting like it had this evidence and it didn't. Um, I think this had to be very closely balanced, and we have these errors and, you know, blowing hack out of the, I call it hack, blowing, blowing the parameters out. And on, so, on that point, counsel, why is that error at all? To, I mean, why is it error to let the jury consider the defendant's demeanor and, and substantive answers in, a, in, a, in the video interview? Um, as evidence, maybe it's weak evidence, but as some evidence tending to show whether or not this defendant acted in, a, in an indifferent manner when he committed the crime. That Why isn't that yeah. some evidence for the jury to consider? That's possible. That's possible. So then it wouldn't be error to direct no. the jury to the evidence. But not the way the prosecution pushed that. He said it was heinous, atrocious, and cruel because the defendant wasn't confessing. He was not helping find that body. Well, did he say that, or did yes. he say just watch the video? He I mean, said the body he just... hasn't even. He said watch that video. The body hasn't even been found. Right. They are doing that to show that he is the, now. It's expanded to the victim's family. Frankly, these poor people are trying to find out what happened, and the defendant isn't even fessing up to that. Well, he is that different. That, what what the prosecutor said was factually correct. True. True. And I, I guess my question correct. is just why can't the jury consider that? Why is it just it one be, point yes. for the jury to consider as they weigh all of these factors? Because it would be factually correct in every single capital murder case where the defendant doesn't confess. Where the defendant gives a statement and doesn't confess, the prosecutor can stand up there and say, he didn't confess, he put people to That's more. not what the prosecutor said here. Well, I think that that is what the jury could take away from that. I'm confused. I thought you said that, that you were arguing that that uh, tape should not have been in evidence because of the Edwards violation. That's that's correct. Okay. That, so I, I, all both. we're talking about is why that would be prejudicial to the defendant is what you're saying. But but the reason the jury should not have been set, told to look at that tape is if we agree with you there's an Edwards violation, that tape shouldn't have been in evidence. No. No, that's I'm a different. Out two that's, a, that's a different error than the prosecutorial error that you're right. arguing. Two separate errors on that tape. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I see I'm out of time. May, may I ask one more quick record question? Do we have the photo lineup that uh, Schritter viewed in the record? That who viewed? Schritter. Schritter? Am I saying that? Schritter? Schritt I don't know how to pronounce the name, but the person who made the in court, the 100% certain in court ID, having having identified a different person in the photo lineup. Does anybody know? I'll ask your opponent if you're not sure. I don't know, but I, but I can tell you on. Okay. Because it wasn't just a matter of her deciding she recognized him at court. She also had actually identified another person. It wasn't, yeah. I can't identify anyone. Okay. I just yeah. wondered if it was there. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, anyway, I see I'm out of time. Uh, Given what's at stake in this case, if you'd like 60 seconds to wrap up, I think we'll then take a mid-morning break. Okay. Unless we have any further questions. I, I do, just a clarification. You, you started out by saying you had three reasons that the statute was unconstitutional. I took it, uh, all I discerned was no adaptive functioning a provision in it and that it used a mental health uh, standard. What, what was the third enumerated reason? <laughs> right, no adaptive functioning um, and then the insanity provision. Mm -hmm. um, there was another one, but 
the, I'm the blanking fact on that it right now. Doesn't very recognize mild I'm mental, sorry? Doesn't recognize mild mental retardation as opposed to requiring severe? Was that it? Yes, but that is what the insanity does. Okay. Uh, that's so what the insanity the provision one. does. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is one the second one. Where, where okay. we have a blank. Um, Council, am I correct that on your request for an Atkins hearing and uh, when it was denied by the trial court that there was no proffer made of what evidence the defendant would have put on had you been permitted to go forward? On the Atkins? Uh, yeah. On our, at the hearing in front of the trial court? Yes. My note says no proffer. I'm just trying to make sure. Well. There's a lot of stuff here and I may have written it uh, down wrong. Proffer or argument, I'm not sure. There was there was argument, right? right. There was the people testifying and the low IQ, um, but not an additional proffer. Okay. 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 And um, I won't uh, I won't summarize. I think I'll just take a seat and listen to how the next part goes. Very well. Thank you, Council. Thank you. We've been at this about an hour. I think it's a good time for the court and the audience to take a break. Court, therefore, the court is now in recess for 15 minutes. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> May it please the court, Chris Elslager appearing on behalf of the state. Uh, <clears throat> and I will start with the, uh, the intellectual disability issue. And I want to take the court back to the, uh, before we get into discussions of uh, constitutionality or potential remands and so on, I, I want to start at the start, which is the initial threshold showing where the defendant had the burden of giving the district court sufficient reason to believe that he might be intellectually disabled. And he utterly failed to meet his burden at that point, which is why there was no Atkins hearing, because he didn't present any evidence that he was intellectually disabled. In fact, his own his own expert said he's not mentally retarded. And his expert is a, is a, a psychologist, a doctor. He was, contrary to what my opposing counsel kind of intimated, he was not making a legal conclusion based on some statute. He may not even have been aware of the statute. He was making a clinical conclusion as a doctor. He said he's not mentally retarded. Given that, I mean, to me, I mean, that, that right there would have been enough for the district court to say, well, you haven't met your burden. But then the district court went further. He had, uh, in addition to the defense expert's testimony, there were uh, uh, competency evaluations, psych evaluations that gave no indication that, that uh, Mr. Thurber was intellectually disabled. The, uh, uh, what I read in the record is that he, the report said that he had a, uh, an IQ in the average range. I don't know that there was a specific number applied. It just said he had an average IQ. He had graduated high school. He'd gone to two years of college and had a, an, an okay GPA. Uh, when, the, when you take in the totality of all that evidence, what was the district court to do? I mean, the, to me, that, that's no indication that the guy is, is intellectually disabled, especially when his own, his own evidence says that. So I don't think you can say that the district, district court erred in not holding an Atkins hearing at that point in time. And really, the discussion should stop there. There's no need to get into the, the other abstract uh, discussions about whether the law is constitutional and, and so on or what the standards is, is If we agree with you, is that determination law of the case as your opposing counsel discussed it or would there be a potential for a collateral process at some point? I believe that if, uh, if as time goes on, he could raise an intellectual disability uh, claim, say in collateral uh, appeals such as 1507 or so forth, if, if he can make the case that he has newly discovered evidence that shows he's now intellectually disabled. If he gets a doctor to, to test him and says, look, he's intellectually disabled, and as Justice Johnson's point out, it is unconstitutional to execute a mentally, an intellectually disabled person. If he could make a, a, a prima facie case of newly discovered evidence that says, Or change circumstances, perhaps. Change, yeah, I mean, I, certainly that's possible. Now, and, and when it comes to intellectual disability, um, you know, the, the law used to say that it had to manifest itself before age 18. That was taken out of the law to account for such things as a traumatic head injury or, you know, the, the brain can degenerate. I don't think someone who is intellectually disabled is ever going to get unintellectually disabled, but it is certainly possible for someone who is in the average range to, uh, to, to gen degenerate. So they get, you know, advanced Alzheimer's or, you know, I don't know what, but, but there are brain diseases. And a person could, if they, you know, if he lingers long enough, 
gets to the point where they're going to execute him, and then he could raise that and say, look, I'm intellectually disabled now, it's unconstitutional. That's something that would have to be dealt with on down the line. But as far as what happened here in the trial court, that ship has sailed. He failed to meet his burden. The evidence, the totality of the evidence, did not indicate that he had an intellectual disability. There was no reason for the judge to hold an Atkins hearing. And if you were to remand it now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get a determination whether he was intellectually disabled at the time. You'd get a determination if he's intellectually disabled now. And to the extent that that would be informative for going forward with the sentence, I don't think it's... That's what we care about, though, isn't it? At the time of execution versus the time of pronouncement. We were trying to ferret that out at the very beginning of your opposing counsel's argument. It's not about pronouncement. It's about execution, right? I think so. Because like I said, I mean, the ship has sailed on at the time the sentence was pronounced. Now all we can do going forward is if he believes and he has actual evidence that he's intellectually disabled, I think there is a mechanism to bring it forward, certainly through 60-1507. You mentioned that, and I want to explore that just a little bit. In other cases, when we talk about ineffective assistance of counsel, as you well know, we don't normally deal with that on direct appeal. But on occasion, a defendant will raise that, and we will sometimes remand for a hearing at that time, even though it hasn't reached the 1507 stage. Is there a reason not to find out sooner rather than later? I just want to understand. I understand your position on not meeting the burden below as of that time, but if there's any possibility, is there a reason to wait to find out? Well, I think we need to bring finality to the direct appeal. But it won't be final if, in fact, he can bring a 1507 and raise this issue. You see what I'm saying? Once they've raised it, why not get it over with? Well, I still think he has to show something that would indicate that there's some reason to do that, and he still hasn't done it. Okay, I understand that's your position on the merits of it, but I want to understand why you think we should wait procedurally. Why should we remand when you don't have anything? Even with a claim of ineffective assistance of counsel, you only remand if, on direct appeal for a Van Cleef hearing, if the new counsel has done sufficient investigation and has raised facts that really show that there is a possibility that there was ineffective assistance. Otherwise, you just say, no, wait until the 1507. I think the same kind of rationale applies here. Excuse me. If I can understand, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your answer. You're not really saying that it's procedurally preferable to wait. You're saying that there's been no showing to deserve a different procedure now. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, because I'm trying to get at the procedural preferability. So assume with me for a moment that there's one new fact, whatever it is, that's been raised now. Then wouldn't it be procedurally preferable to get it over with? I think it would depend on the fact, because there's other, beyond this one issue. The problem is, is the longer these cases are out there still pending direct appeal, it brings up, we saw this with Clayton, we saw this with this case, when we have supplemental briefs raising new, more and more issues and new issues, and it seems like the cases never go on procedurally, the case will always be in a state of direct appeal. And I think unless there is a real good showing that there might really be a need for an Atkins hearing, we shouldn't perpetuate this case or any of these cases in a constant state of direct appeal. This has been direct appeal, I think, 10 years now or something along those lines. It's procedural, unless he makes a good showing that there's some real reason to believe that there might be some merit to it. I mean, it's unfair to the state, it's unfair to the- I've asked you to assume that. Okay. And that's why I'm trying to understand why it's your position that we shouldn't dispose of as many issues as possible. Again, I mean, I'm not saying- Excuse me, counsel, I wasn't finished talking. So if you could just wait just a second. I'm just trying to understand why it's preferable to put off to collateral attack what can be dealt with in the direct appeal, if there are facts to support it. Okay, well, if there are facts to support it- And I understand you think you'd prefer that, but I'm trying to get to the law supporting it or some other kind of argument. I guess I didn't fully understand your hypothetical. You said just one new fact. I mean, I'm not saying it would be totally easy if there was some sufficient- I mean, if there's a sufficient reason to believe it, then sure. Yeah, I mean, nobody wants to execute a guy who is intellectually disabled, who is not- who constitutionally could not be executed. The state's not interested in doing that. But what we are interested in is not perpetuating proceedings over and over again if there's not a real reason to do that. And it seems to me that saying, let's put it off to a 1507, is doing exactly that, is perpetuating infinity on these proceedings. 
Well, except that if you perpetuate an indirect appeal, eventually when the direct appeal gets done, there still will be a 1507. I mean, that's still going to happen. He'll still raise an effective census counsel or something else. I mean, so it's not, it's not actually shortening anything up. Um, and again, if there is an actual, if there's actual evidence to indicate that he might be intellectually disabled, then, you know, fine, a, a remand, I mean, we're not going to, uh, I mean, we may not like a remand, but it's not going to, uh, that's not the end of the world. If, but if, if that happened, let's just continue now with the hypothetical. If there was a remand, what, how would it work? as a practical matter when if the statutes if the reason the, if there's a remand in part is that, that we've got a problem with the statute then what's how, do, how does a remand well, proceed I wouldn't think the remand would occur because you have a problem with the statute the only thing the only purpose of the remand would be to, to, to hold Given an Atkins hearing, hearing. but Given. there's no statute if we also said that the statute's problematic then what what's the standard for a hearing that's you see what I'm getting at yeah. what, 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 do, what do we tell the district court to do well, first, I don't think you can get to the statute because, as I've raised in the brief, I don't think he's got standing yet. I understand yet. that. Yeah. Um, if you were to go that way and say that you had an, an issue with the statute, you thought the statute would be unconstitutional. I mean, it depends on what your ruling is, but obviously if you think the statute's unconstitutional, then a remand would be pointless. Right? That's the problem. Yeah, there's nothing to do a remand hearing under. Is right. It? But I'm, I'm proceeding under the... Uh, uh, under the position that the statute is constitutional and this court is not going to find it constitutional. I really don't think, uh, as a matter of standing, that the defendant can, can well, challenge the statute. Well, why does there have to be a statute? I mean, it, the substance of this law arises out of the United States oh. Constitution. Well, that's a good point. I mean, you so could why, why, why does there have to be a statute well, you're at right. all? right. There doesn't need to be a statute. Just under the case law, rather. Than under the case law. That's, a, okay. that's an excellent point, Mr. Stiegel. That's why you're there and I'm here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I didn't thought of that, but yeah, it, it's it's case law uh, driven. So I mean, it, you could remand it for an Atkins hearing. You know, the, the district court would have to kind of fashion the test off the case law, uh, but I think that's possible. But as I've, I've pointed out, I don't think he has standing to, to raise that. But if the court is not uh, interested in discussing standing, I'll, I will move on. Um, I guess the. Uh, the other issue, the, the issue of the uh, the statements to uh, uh, the videotape statement to Agent Atterbury, uh, as we set forth in the brief, the, the defendant reinitiated contact. Let me focus on that. Yes. Your notion of reinitiating is in the car at three thirty in the morning with Deputy Owen, right? There's no other reinitiation that you think occurs, right? Yes, I believe that's correct. So, in the car, uh, Mr. Thurber says, I want to talk to uh, the detective or the KBI agent. He gets back to the county jail. The city uh, police officer, Lieutenant Moore, I think it is, calls and says, what do you want him to talk about? It's four in the morning. Oh, I want, there's some stolen property. So, Lieutenant Moore makes the decision that he doesn't want to tell us where the body is or where the victim is. He wants to talk about something extraneous. How is that reinitiation? Well, because I the think the law is pretty clear that you have to initiate about the investigation that's underway, right? Yeah, I think yes, yeah, so but I think what he said, and I, so I don't have the record right in front of me, but it was something about just he wanted to talk to the agents again, right? And. But he can talk about the weather if he right. wants to, and that doesn't trigger a reinitiation of, of uh, questioning about the investigation when he has invoked his right to counsel. Yeah, but I think you know, just under the context that what he said was vague enough that I think the officers understood that he wanted to he wanted to talk about the case again. Well, no, the lieutenant makes a phone call. And once he makes that phone call and finds out this guy wants to talk about stolen property with, by somebody else, he knows now what the subject is. And if that's not bad enough, when Detective Mattis gets to work the next morning and Lieutenant Moore says, hey, Thurber wants to talk to you, and the first thing Mattis says to him is, what do you want to talk about? And he says, that's stolen property. So I, I don't see how you get around the Edwards violation under those facts, so take me there. Well, I, I, I guess... You just, say he reinitiated a discussion about the investigation, 
And the facts don't seem to say that. I guess it's just a, a difference of, of, of interpreting the, the statements. I, what do you interpret about that that says Thurber wants to talk about the criminal investigation? I, I think that he just, you know, obviously there's going to be a difference of opinion, but I think he, he said, I want to talk again, and that was enough. Now, if you don't think that's enough... Then but it, I'm saying, not that I think it's enough, the case law says it's not enough. The United States Supreme Court says it's not enough to just say, I want to talk about the weather, right. and so detectives can come in and start interrogating right. about the crime. I guess I just don't recall that, that there were being as, uh, that specific and narrow about his about his reinitiation. But There's no dispute about what Lieutenant Moore took away from his phone call. Okay. And there's no dispute what Detective Mattis said when he went back in I, I don't, to have I, the talk. My memory That's of, the I, problem, counsel. Yeah, my, my memory of the record is that, that they were, at the time, they were they were interested in finding uh, Jody. They didn't know if she was alive or dead, and, and it, they determined that he didn't have any life-saving information. They weren't going to talk to him about it at that time, and we could wait, wait till the morning. Um, I don't recall specifically what, what Thurber said. That's pretty important, though, uh, for this legal yeah. analysis, okay? So let's walk through and assume you've lost the admissibility of the videotape. They've conceded that it doesn't impact the uh, guilt phase. We may have to look at it as an unassigned error, but let's not worry about that right now. Tell me why that doesn't prejudice the sentencing phase, as counsel has argued. Well, uh, certainly because it's just, it's just one small factor. I mean, all and, and really, all the the prosecutor did was reference his demeanor, his cool, uh, you know, his his cool cat demeanor in that in that video, um, and, and that's, I think, in that context, I don't think it uh, I don't think it's error. Uh, to the extent it's error, I think it, it would be very minor because the rest of the, you know, the, the penalty phase focused on the the aggravating sort of the heinous, atrocious, cruel nature of, of the injuries to. Uh, Jody and, and her mental anguish of being uh, uh, abducted and, and driven out into the into the uh, uh, wilderness and, and, and so on. The defense so, seems to, to make it sound like a Brady violation. That what's being implied here is that the guy that Mr. Thurber didn't confess, and, and I, so he's being the jury is being told that implicitly. Uh, and he has a right not to talk to him, constitutional right not to talk to the police. I, I just I don't take away the, the prosecutor's statement as, as being anything about uh, a, a failure to confess. I think he was he was talking about the the, the cool indifferent nature that that the ran after just murdering someone. He was just he, you know where most people would probably we, we would we would assume would be. Uh, in a state of, of anxiousness or, or nervousness or heightened anxiety and so on, and that he was just cool. He didn't really care. He was, he, you know, he, he, he was indifferent to, to, to everything. And it just shows that he was, uh, uh, that basically he was a cold-blooded killer. And that goes to the, uh, the heinous, atrocious, uh, cruel, um, aggravating circumstance. Uh, I don't, I mean, I never, reading that, I, I never took away from that the implication that the defense counsel is raising, and I don't think the jury would take that away from it. Let's so. talk about the in-court identification. Okay. It seems to be extremely suggestive for the state to ask a witness, do you see the person that you saw that day? Oh yeah, he's the one sitting there at the, at the defense table with the two defense lawyers on either side of him and maybe a sheriff's deputy behind him. Um, that's almost like pointing at a photo lineup and saying, that's the guy. I mean, isn't that, isn't that right? Well, yeah, it's certainly, certainly suggested. I mean, and, and in your briefing, you only say in one sentence, that's not error, and then you jump to harmless, as I recall. Um, and you know that's not good enough to, to argue the merits, so really you're stuck with whether that's harmless error, right? Well, I, I, you know, in-court identification happens all the time, and, and it usually didn't, doesn't generate much. It's not really, it's not error. I mean, to say, yeah, that's the guy. The only, I think, the only problem where where you're getting potential error here is that she had initially been unable to pick him out of a lineup. She picked the wrong person out of the lineup. Um, so when you when you factor that in, if you're going to say, well, 
then then maybe her her in court testament or in court identification is not as reliable as it usually is considered to be. Then my argument is, yeah, but that was all presented to the jury. The jury knew that they were able to weigh her credibility. Um, and but the state got an ID. It got something else to say in closing arguments. She identified that man. Right. That they the, wouldn't have had if they hadn't asked the question. And I and I and you know, and. and and I guess I'm asking this because there is case, and you could have cited case law that would support it not being error, and you you didn't do that. So now I think I'm into. I don't think that case law matters. I think you're stuck. So well, now we're talking about harmless, and the state added a piece of evidence that it didn't have before. It got the in court identification, even though it contradicted what she had said. In during her interview, that seems to be a little something. I do want to disagree with you on the point of it about. I don't think we're stuck with harmless error. I mean, I think we we challenge it. It's, it's not error. But you didn't uh, cite us any case law. You didn't make any argument, and you know that we just don't let people make I, conclusory uh, arguments without. Uh, at I, least you could have said and look at these cases, but you didn't even do that. You just have a sentence that says no error. Well, I, I think that's something that is that is so uh, that. Happens so often, so regularly in court identification. I, I probably we just didn't think that that really needed to be done. It's you know it is it is established. I mean, there's some things that are they've so cited a whole bunch of case law that but it's error. And they I, had and you had that before you wrote the. I don't want to yeah, belabor it. I just I, I really think you. I want to sure that court is Counsel, I'm not conceding that it was I'm error. I'm having trouble but, understanding questions and answers when they're on top of each other. I, I apologize. So if we could be more careful, I'd appreciate it. Thank okay, I, I, I apologize, but that's obviously entirely my fault. Um, I, I'm not conceding that it was error, but assuming that, that it is, uh, there there is another I think very strong reason why it, it's harmless because his DNA was found in her car. The whole point of the testimony was to indicate that he was in the car. But we have his DNA in the car. He didn't know Jody before this happened. He, he had never been in her car. There was no reason for his DNA to be in her, her car. So at most, that identification was cumulative. We know he was in the car. His DNA was there. The jury knew he, he was in the car. So there, there's, there, there can be no harm from, from the air. And if there are no questions, I guess the... Uh, the last point that opposing counsel made, I believe, was prosecutorial misconduct. And I don't recall, I don't recall which, uh, I don't recall the discussions that he made. Are there any questions from the court on, on that issue or any other issues? What about the argument that it was improper to reference the involvement of the defendant's parents? Ah, yeah, that, and my response to that is, is that that was the response to the, you know, the proposed mitigation uh, evidence. His mitigator was that, uh, was something about the emotional trauma, the fertile, fertile loss of emotional trauma to the family. And, and I think the prosecutor's point was, look, that's, that's not really, you shouldn't give that much weight because he doesn't care. He, you know, he, he's never cared about, uh, about his family. There, there's already, there's not, there's not really a real relationship to, to, to lose there so that it shouldn't be it shouldn't be given much weight as a mitigating circumstance. I think that's what the prosecutor was, was going for. The problem with that answer is that there's another reference in the closing statement where the prosecutor says utter indifference, which of course is on the aggravator side of the instructions. Utter indifference, utter indifference. Then he makes a reference to mom and dad. Then he follows that back up with utter indifference. I'm having I understand the statement you want to focus on when he's talking, and he does say at the beginning of that paragraph, I want to talk about mitigators. Now I'm going to talk about mom and dad. But the statement I'm talking about is during his uh, recitation about aggravators, and on either side of the sentence about mom and dad are his utter indifference to others. It seems to me that that has to be seen as pointing to the aggravators. 
just like when on a premeditation, on you know instant premeditation, which we have in this case, you've got on the front end a statement that's a correct statement of the law, and then at the end of it you've got a correct yeah. statement. And we look at it in context and go, that's not a problem. In this case, if we look at it in context, it seems to be a problem. And I, I will admit it is it is problematic that he, he laces that throughout. Um, it, and the only thing I can say, you know, it's, it's closing argument. You know, I, I don't believe he was reading from a script. Um, and I think I think he was trying to, you know, he's hammering different points different times. It, it may have, it would have been cleaner had he not done, had he not laced that throughout there. You want to move over to harmless then? Because, I mean, well, really, because yeah. counsel talked a lot about the conscious suffering of the victim and that being a, a weaker part of your case. I suppose the response to that is your mental anguish side was pretty uh, substantial. But you want to move over to harmless then and talk about that in response to what counsel said? Well, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, when it comes to both the mental and physical anguish, I don't think it's speculative at all. Um, but on the mental anguish side, I mean, this, this girl was abducted at her, you know, at her uh, mailbox in, in the middle of the afternoon by a, a, a very large man that she did not know, and she's driven around for several hours. And I don't think it takes any, uh, it, it doesn't take any mental gymnastics to to uh, infer that she was very uncertain as to what was going to happen, very frightened. And she she didn't know this guy. She she didn't know what he was going to do. Uh, and and that, well, this went on for hours. And he drove her away from town, out to a secluded area. Um, so I think I think any of us can make the logical inference that in those three or four or five hours that she was uh, stuck with him, that she was suffering severe mental anguish. She had no idea what was going to happen to her uh, at the end of this, if she was ever going to get home and see her family again or, or what. And I, I don't think that there's – probably don't need to spend a lot of argument on that. I mean, that's I think that's a pretty logical inference that, that anybody can make. Um, when it comes to the physical abuse, the physical anguish, I mean, she certainly was conscious for some of that. She was beaten pretty, pretty severely, um, and, and yeah, her she was hit in the head so hard that the, that a, uh, a blood vessel broke, an artery broke. But you know, the breaking of a blood vessel doesn't cause instantaneous uh, unconsciousness. You know, a blood vessel is just is a blood vessel. There's no testimony that she suffered any kind of nerve damage or anything from from the uh, the blow to the head that would have caused. Uh, unconsciousness. So, the uh, I mean, the default is consciousness, and I think it's it's safe to uh, make that logical inference that, that she was conscious at least through uh, a significant portion of the beating that she took, and when he started strangling her. And now, the strangling took uh, several minutes, and and we know the experts say that after a few minutes of strangling, a person will pass out. But he he let go of her neck and then reinitiated strangling uh, off and on, as the, the expert testified. And so it took up to 12 minutes. And I think it is logical to infer that at least for a portion of that, as he strangled her and let go and strangled her and let go, that she uh, did not immediately pass out, and that she maintained consciousness and was aware that, uh, of what was happening and was, of course, uh, suffering both mental and physical anguish. Uh, and I think that's more than enough to establish the heinous, atrocious, and cruel uh, aggravating circumstance, regardless of any um, these other issues that we talked about, which I think really ultimately are kind of extraneous in the jury's uh, ultimate conclusion of, of what happened to Jody was heinous, it was atrocious, it was cruel. Um, and, and so I think any of these other, you know, off statements by the prosecutor that you may find to be problematic were ultimately harmless. Does that, conclude, does that conclude your presentation? Unless there are any other questions from the court, I will. Uh, I, I have some sure. questions, uh, more theoretical. Uh, if we were to find uh, uh, multiple instances of uh, prosecutorial error, uh, and we've said that you can consider the cumulative effect of that. Um, and what do we look at? Typically, we look at, is there any uh, reasonable possibility that it would have changed the verdict? But I'm unclear how you can do that analysis when we've also said that mercy is a mitigator. And how can we do the weighting, the weighing um, hypothetically, hypothetically uh, uh, do it without the 
errors. You understand what I'm trying to ask you? Well, ultimately, I think first it does depend on what you find to be an error. Um, I think there are some errors that you can look at and say, well, that probably played no role in in the jury's uh, determination. I, I think the the issue with the, the the video to me that's just a. I know certainly if I was on the jury, I wouldn't really it really wouldn't mean anything to me. Um, and I think there's some 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 potential errors or like are you well know, it meant something to the prosecutor because the prosecutor admitted it and argued it certainly but but I, I think when you look at these things and the I mean you got to remember the prosecutor's moving forward and we're all looking back in hindsight um, but I think there are some things like you know one you know one word here or there that or one misplaced statement I think you can look at and say well that that probably wasn't uh, that didn't matter now if you you accumulate them that's it's a more difficult challenge. I mean, you... Counsel, I, I think I understand, uh, and that's what we go through when we have facts that we're, right. we're dealing with. But when we're talking about the concept, the ephemeral concept of mercy that is in the calculus, uh, it, it just, to me, it makes it uh, counterintuitive that we can take pieces out and, and do that process uh, without being totally speculative. Well, and I think, I, I believe it was in Kleypas, I think there's a couple of paragraphs of the discussion on this, and of course as I stand here at the podium, I can't remember exactly what the court said in, in Kleypas about, about this, how it is. It is more challenging when you're dealing with a more of a, a subjective weighing as opposed to just finding whether facts exist or not. And I would simply, I guess, refer you back to the, I, I believe it was the Clayton's decision, and I, once I sit down at the table, I'm sure I can find the site, but there's a, uh, a couple paragraphs of the, the Clayton's yeah. court said, here's, here's what we consider, and yeah, it is, it is more challenging, but it can be done. Yeah. Clayton's also, Clayton's three anyway, also said because of the life and death nature of the penalty phase proceedings, the prosecutor has a heightened duty to refrain from prosecutorial error. So um, how does that fit in? The, do we does that fit into the calculus of uh, harmless error, or is well, that only a part of the error? I think that probably goes more, and I'm shooting from the hip here. I think it really goes more to the error rather than. I mean, once once you find error, then you have to determine how much whether it prejudiced or whether you know, whether it was harmful or not. Um, and, and I think you you do as the Clampus Court directed it. You can't. It, it is more difficult, but it can be done in courts, appellate courts. Across the country, do it. So it's not it's not something that can't be done by a court. I suppose it depends on on how willing the justices are to, uh, you know, how flexible you you want to be in that. Uh, it's uh, that's that's not something that really does not have it doesn't have a definite answer, Justice Johnson. I can't I can't tell you that there's a formula or a mathematical approach to it. But not all other courts place mercy in the mitigator category, do they? That's true, yeah. uh, although I think most do allow for consideration of mercy, but where it fits in the, in the calculus might be a little bit different. Any more questions? And that concluded your presentation? Yes, it does, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you very much. You reserve 15 minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to pick up. I'd like to pick up just where that left off on the harmless error, some of the harmless error ideas and prosecutorial misconduct. Um, I do not agree on the uh, conscious suffering. That the default is that there was conscious suffering. That simply cannot be in this case. The fact is that. There was physical evidence, but there was nothing indicating whether there would be conscious physical suffering or not conscious physical suffering, except speculation. Those aren't reasonable inferences that the trier of fact can draw from these facts? <sighs> not, not to tip the balance one way or the other not to tip the balance one way or the other. It remains speculative. And when the prosecution was doing its opening statement and going through all that and saying, you know, pretending to be her all the way to the end, 
telling the jury that she was suffering consciously all the way to the exact end of her life. That was made up. There was no basis that, that she could be consciously, physically suffering all the way to, through the very end of her life after she had been hit on the head hard enough to tear that artery and strangle. So I, I believe the reason why they did that pretended to be a first-person narration because the other way that they would have done it, which would have been proper, they would have said, here's the physical evidence. This poor woman was found under this brush pile, and here's some footprints leading there. We believe the defendant was there, and there's marks of strangulation, and it looks like she was hit over the head. <coughs> now, here's our theory of the case. Here's what we believe happened, but it's up to you, jury. It's up to you to decide. Are you, are you arguing here prosecutorial error or a lack of substantial evidence to support the finding of um, the aggravator, or both? <laughs> actually, I drifted into both. I drifted into both. I'm, I'm saying that the weight of the aggravator, it doesn't have the weight that the prosecution has been arguing that it did. Well, but once it's, if you, if there's, if there's sufficient evidence to support the finding, can't the prosecutor and the defendant argue the weight to the jury? Yeah, sure. So, so what's improper about that? Not in opening statements. This was done in opening. Actually, it was done all through, but in opening, it was where it was the most improper. And then certainly in arguing the weight, the prosecutor can't pretend like the prosecutor is there watching it happen. And as I say, I think the reason they did that is because they didn't have it. They did not have what they pretended to have. Um, but certainly the default is not consciousness. It can be either one if the default was consciousness. What, what prevents counsel, defense counsel in closing argument saying just what you said? Right. They shouldn't. They absolutely shouldn't. They should wait, not wait, wait, stand wait. up. No, 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 no. What right. I'm saying is that uh, the state puts on what are reasonable inferences from the evidence that we have. Yeah. And then what prevents you or defense counsel from coming up? These are just inferences and then pointing to the weaknesses and the inferences based just on what you said. And then let the jury kind of try to hash that out. Isn't that what happens in closing argument? Right. Well, of course, I was, I was talking. Not, not you, but, but it, yeah. it, at trial. What, what prevented that from happening? And it probably did happen. Well... Um, actually, the defense didn't really have a closing argument, I don't think, in this case. But, but what, what, yeah. the, that's the state, the state closes with what we have here, what are the reasonable inferences, jurors, that you can reach this conclusion, and then counsel responds just as you did. Yeah. That's not what they did. Isn't, isn't, that what's, isn't that what a trial's about? Yes, but that's not what they did, Your Honor. They didn't do it that way. They didn't say, here's the physical evidence, and here... Is no, no, no. Or, or, Let's say they did what Mr. Elslager said that gave, articulated what, what he just articulated, which I think is what the state did. What prevents counsel from responding to that just in the, in the means that you, manner you did? And why isn't that proper? That's what well, happens at trial. Yeah, I think, I think that the improper part about it is, is skipping a step. In other words, you didn't skip the step, you filled that step in and said, here's the evidence and here's a reasonable inference from the evidence. I mean, you, you said that. And that's how, it, that's how it should be said, but the polar opposite of that is to be pretending like you're at the crime scene and making a dramatic narrative out, out of it as though it is solid fact, right? In, instead, of, instead of arguing it, you pretend like you're a witness. And the experienced prosecutor, maybe the jurors think that the prosecutor and then what prevents the defense counsel from getting up and saying, you know, uh, Mr. Prosecutor wasn't there, and then recite what weaknesses is in that perception. I, I, well, I'm right. Well, sure. I, I think it would be very improper for a defense counsel to say, imagine he and she walking along that trail, and he whacked her over the head. He whacked her over the head with that thing and knocked her unconscious. No, and, and I appreciate the, okay. the problems with first-person narration, right. but I, I, I just think there's, there's some play in here that can happen at trial that you're not recognizing. Okay, I understand. 
Um, and in terms of uh, in terms of harmlessness, you know, this is a this is not the kind of case uh, that this court has seen before, where you have multiple bodies, you have multiple aggravating circumstances, you have prior murders. This is an evenly balanced aggravator against mitigators. And it had to have been closely balanced. This, uh, you know, so, so how can it said, be said behind, beyond a reasonable doubt that these errors had little or no effect on something that had to be closely balanced? Um, and the Atterbury interview, my gosh, they brought that up in their opening of the, of the penalty phase. And the prosecutor implored the jury about that Atterbury interview, utter indifference to the sufferings of others. I ask you keep those things in mind. How I have to assume the jury did keep that in mind, just like the prosecutor implored them to do when they balanced the aggravators and mitigators, and it should not have been in front of them. And, he's, and the prosecution did the closing with that also, the Atterbury interview. Her body has not even been found. Opening and closing, why did they say that if they didn't intend for that to have an effect on this jury? They did, and now they say, well, it didn't have an effect. Well, why did they say it? They intended it for it to have an effect. Um, the prosecution misstated the evidence on how long it took for, 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 to die of strangulation. They just doubled it. They took the pathologist's testimony, three to five minutes, it would be immediate unconsciousness, but they just took the testimony on how long it would take to die and just doubled it. Um, they demolished the defense is mitigator that a term of imprisonment is sufficient to defend and protect people's safety. That mitigator is backed up by an instruction that says the person will have life without parole, and that instruction is backed up by a statute that says the defendant will remain in prison for the rest of his natural life, and it has a whole string of ways that defendant will never leave prison. Okay, but the prosecutor says that mitigator, 20, he's 25, young and healthy, it's no guarantee. The prosecutor's trying to scare this jury. This guy might get out. Well, a jury faced with somebody like this, if they think there is any possibility that that person will get out, uh, I think they're highly likely to just ex vote for to have them executed. It seems clearly improper. Um, and I already went through the dramatic script in the opening and so on and so forth. Um, that will conclude my presentation unless there are questions. Any more questions? I see none. Thank you, counsel. Thank you very much. I thank you both for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement. That concludes today's docket. Court is now adjourned.